You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper, and we're going to go straight down to Phoenix for tonight's metal report. Good evening, Gene. Good evening, Bill. How are you doing? Fine. Doing better than the stock market, I'll imagine. Oh, well, I warned everybody, didn't I? Yeah, we've been warning them for a while here. Well, let's take a look at what's happening here. Today, gold had a high of 386.90, a low of 383.10, to close at uh, 384.90. Up 50 cents. Uh, silver had a high of 557, a low of 541 to close at $5.50, down 4 cents. Uh, platinum did 450, had a high of 415, a low of 40150 to close at 41270, up $2.30. And the mighty Dow had, had a high of 36.9550. 30, at a low of 36.56.10 to close at 36.79.70, up $4.30. Uh, so far to date, we've lost a little over from the high in the stock market, which was uh, early part of this year. We've lost over 300 points in the stock market. And to put it in uh, real terms that people can understand, that is a loss of over $300 billion that is just basically, poof, gone up in smoke or it's in somebody's pocket, certainly not the investors at this point. And like you said, uh, we tried to tell them, uh, last year alone, $1.5 trillion was pumped into the stock market, which I believe was like $32 billion more than the record year that happened in 92. And this was by and large people that had taken money out of their savings accounts, their CDs, and they were literally forced by the Federal Reserve into the stock market, which was highly speculative, highly risky, very over much, very overvalued. And then all of a sudden, boom, it dries up, the rugs pulled out from under them, and then billions and billions of dollars are lost. And during this time, gold and silver just held in there very, very steady. It maybe moved up or down one or two percent during this uh, during this major uh, decline that's lost nearly ten uh, percent of its value. I guess I wonder which one I would rather have my money in, uh, something that's been fluctuating within one percent or something that's lost over, you know, nearly ten percent of its value. Are you asking me? Sure, I'm <laughs> asking you. Well, you know where I put my money. I put my money into real things that are going to hold value. The stock market is, uh, well, it's a scam anyway. It's like going to Las Vegas and rolling dice on a crap table. If you're not a large uh, investor with uh, hundreds of millions of dollars behind you, then uh, you're just, uh, you're like a fly. <laughs> Basically legalized gambling. That's right. And uh, you're highly at risk. Folks, we got some information. We have a brand new newsletter just came out this last week. Uh, call to get it. It's free. It's, it's, it's some great information about what's happening in the markets, uh, what's happening in the gold and silver markets, uh, uh, what's happening in the numismatic market and the junk silver and so on and so forth. We'd be more than happy to get it out to you. But don't become just an information junkie. Uh, do something with this information. Put it to good use. Uh, uh, do something constructive with it and, and uh, do something that ultimately down the road you're going to be able to survive with. Uh, when it comes time to it, uh, I guess you got to ask yourself, if I take all those stocks because it gets into the grocery store, if I take some junk silver or, or gold into the grocery store, which one is that guy going to take and, and how, how, which one am I going to be able to feed my family with and, and survive with? I guess the answer becomes real simple when we bring it down to basic terms. And uh, Let us help you out. Give us a call, 
289-2646. That's again, 1-800-289-2646. Give us a call. We'll get some information out to you and, uh, let's get you educated and let's get you, let's get you started in protecting your families. Thank you, Gene. Thank you, Bill. Have a good evening. We'll see you next week. All right, sir. Okay, folks. You heard it. Call now, 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. Mention my name. Get all the newsletters and free literature that you're entitled to as a listener to the Hour of the Time. And while you're at it, thank them for sponsoring this program. You know, something. some people just don't understand. They don't get the message. I've been getting a lot of calls from convicted felons lately, taking me to task because... I told them, or I told the world, that they should not allow convicted felons in their militia units. And that is absolutely correct, and I stand by it. Folks, we have to get the public on our sides. The public must be able to look at the militia units and not be afraid of them. They must understand that the militia is there to protect the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. If they see a bunch of convicted felons, no matter how innocent they claim they were, no matter how innocent the crimes they claim they were convicted were, it doesn't matter. It's the public perception that counts. One fellow called me up and objected, and when I stuck to my guns and told him that that's exactly what I believe, and that's exactly what I'm going to put out to the world, and that's exactly what I'm going to recommend to militia units when they contact me, he began to call me back and proved, proved that I am correct when I say that. Because he turned in to what he was, a convicted felon, began making threats, began making a complete ass out of himself, and is probably, no doubt, going to continue. But remember, folks, when you do that, if you do that, we tape all those calls, and they're always turned over to the local sheriff, and one copy is always sent to the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Step right up, ladies and gentlemen, to the Whitewater Carnival. Get your tickets, one thin dime. Step right up, yes sir, yes sir, here's your change. Step right in, in the camp. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. All your questions will be answered inside. See the Bellaries, the only Chinese presidency in the history of the United States. See the documents that convicted them of treason and criminal activity that resulted in the impeachment of Bellaries. The presidency is coming down. White fighter is king. Step right up, folks. Right in to the camp. Take a seat. See the hoochie coochie dancers of the Billy Cabinet. Folks, tonight's program comes to you from a report by Nick Guarino from. Uh, Information collected by CADGI members, from my research, and from the research of many other people. Bill Clinton is the greatest criminal ever to occupy the White House. Nixon's crimes were those of a truant schoolboy compared to what Clinton has pulled off. Right now, Bill Clinton is being investigated for possible criminal bank fraud, for possible election fraud, and for obstruction of justice for events surrounding the possible murder of his own Deputy White House Counsel, Vincent Foster. Clinton has also been served with a subpoena requesting his documents in a criminal matter other than Whitewater Connections. A special, a special grand jury has now been convened in Little Rock, Arkansas for a criminal indictment of Bill Clinton and a number of his cronies for Whitewater, the looting of Madison Guarantee Savings and Loan, and illegal small business administrative loans. Federal Judge Stephen Reasoner said that a compelling case for the need for a special grand jury was presented to him, and this is the first time in American history any president has ever faced a grand jury. <laughs> the research of Nick Guarino and many others and personal knowledge indicate that these investigations have only begun to scratch the surface of the corruption and larceny that has characterized Clinton's political career. 
Based on the thousands of pages of documents that I've studied and the witnesses I've spoken to, I believe Bill Clinton is guilty of extortion and racketeering. It's common knowledge among businessmen in Arkansas that politics in their state is based upon a system of shakedowns. Some examples. Dan Lassiter was a big Clinton campaign contributor. He got the lucrative bond contracts despite the horrendous reputation of his firm and despite his known connections to drug dealers. James McDougall diverted funds from his SNL to pay off Clinton's debts and finance his political ambitions. In turn, he was protected from the regulators. Seth Ward was a director of the SNL that gave huge loans to Clinton and his cronies. He was awarded a 2.7 million bond issue for his Park on Meter Incorporated. Bank fraud. Using Whitewater and other real estate schemes, Clinton and his cronies looted millions from at least one savings and loan in the Small Business Administration. Clinton also used his political power as governor of Arkansas to prevent state regulators from closing the SNL until four years after it had essentially become insolvent. Another SNL in almost identical shape was slammed out immediately. The result was the heaviest percentage loss of any savings and loan in the United States. Campaign fraud. Documents that Nick Guarino and others have seen indicate that Clinton has lied about his campaign donations, lied about diversions of funds of his campaign accounts from SBA loans taken out by his cronies and never repaid. Suppressed criminal referrals that were waiting for him at the United States Attorney's Office in Little Rock while he ran for president and used funds that were looted from an SNL and the SBA to finance his campaign. Tampering with federal witnesses. James McDougall has said publicly that he could sink the Clinton's Whitewater claims, quote, quicker than they could lie about it if I could get in a position so I wouldn't have my head beaten off, unquote. Many witnesses appear to have been paid off in the form of cushy jobs with high salaries or lucrative government deals. One, Vince Foster, has turned up mysteriously dead. Others have turned up dead. In fact, over 28 people closely connected to William Clinton are now dead, ladies and gentlemen. Many have been beaten, threatened, arrested, thrown in jail on trumped-up charges. Destroying documents requested in a criminal investigation. There have been over 80 subpoenas for documents surrounding Whitewater and Clinton. Many documents from Whitewater are missing entirely. Bill and Hillary's partners, the McDougals, claim they hand-delivered all the paperwork to the Clintons. Bill and Hillary, or Billery, say they never received it. Checks are gone, disappeared. Deeds are gone, disappeared, loan payments, their sources and their recipients have been obscured. And it has just come out that Whitewater documents have been shredded at the Rose Law Firm where Hillary worked. At least nine criminal prosecutions recommended by the RTC were once turned down because the missing documents made the case too difficult to prove. Obstructing justice, Clinton refused to cooperate with banking officials in their investigation of Whitewater and the savings and loan that financed it, Madison Guarantee. Then he negotiated a special subpoena for himself with his hand-picked Attorney General, Janet Reno, the mastermind of the massacre at Waco, that put the documents in the protective custody of the Justice Department where no other regulatory agency, let alone the public, is permitted to see them. This is an outrage. Writing public officials. Evidence shows that officials who cooperated with Clinton in allowing his schemes to continue were repeatedly rewarded with appointments and other special favors. He also used his political power to keep people who had damaging information quiet, to shut them up. Even the police were paid off to provide him with special services and to keep their mouths shut about what those special services were. Accessory to murder. Nick Guarino, myself, William Cooper, and many others are convinced that Deputy White House Counsel Vince Foster was murdered because he knew too much about Whitewater and the other bank and real estate scams. On top of this, it appears that he was having an affair with Hillary Clinton. 
While his death has been covered up as a suicide, the physical evidence at the crime scene directly contradicts that conclusion. The Clintons and their associates have interfered with the police investigation of Foster's death and have tampered with the evidence. And Hillary has all along been a key player. Hillary was not, ladies and gentlemen, at home baking chocolate chip cookies while Bill committed all the crimes. She was an essential co-conspirator. Through her law firm, under the shield of attorney-client privilege, she committed extraordinary breaches of ethics to protect Clinton and his cronies from the bank regulators. She was intimately involved in Whitewater, intimately, deeply involved in Whitewater. She concocted a fraudulent scheme to keep Madison Guarantee open while Clinton and his cronies continued to loot millions from the deposits. And while on hire by the government, she conducted secret out-of-court settlements that protected the Clinton cronies and cost the American taxpayers hundreds of millions, possibly billions of dollars. Clinton already is the first president in American history to have a criminal referral, the last step before an indictment mentioning him personally. Representative James Leach confirmed that this criminal referral was issued. He also confirmed that it has never been made public by the government. The entire investigation is being stonewalled by Clinton and his appointees in the Justice Department and specifically the mastermind of the massacre at Waco, Texas, Janet Reno. Clinton has surrounded himself by loyal co-conspirators who are willing to do anything to protect him. Anything. And where have we heard that before? Oh, I'm only following orders. Nearly every key position in Washington is now staffed by Clinton appointees. This includes the top people at the Justice Department, the temporary head of the RTC, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and scores of subordinate bureaucrats and the regulatory agencies. These are the very people who should be upholding justice and stood there helping him cover up his crimes, and over 95% of them can be proven Marxists, socialists globalists. Many of these same Clinton appointees lied to you about Clinton's past. During the 1992 campaign for president, a criminal referral for Clinton had already been waiting process in Arkansas. Clinton's friends in Little Rock suppressed it. If this fact had been made public, Clinton's campaign would have come to a screeching halt. Who was his partner in suppressing all of this information? Not just this, but all of it. The press, ladies and gentlemen. Gary Hart was guilty of having his picture taken next to a beautiful woman on a fishing boat, and all hopes of his reaching the presidency was destroyed as the press published that photograph and made accusations from coast to coast. But Clinton was able to suppress everything, both from the public and the Republican Party, and the press helped him do it, because the press, mainly, is Marxist also. And it's obvious that this, this, <laughs> was the key to the Clinton election. Of course, with a little help of Pat Buchanan, H. Ross Perot, and the fact that George Bush didn't even run, after the Bilderberg Group in 1991 determined that William Clinton would be the next president of the United States. Now Clinton's spin doctors are trying to hide the facts about Whitewater from you. They are lying to you about the bankrupt savings and loan that Clinton and his cronies looted mercilessly to line their own pockets and further their political aims. They are lying to you about the Small Business Administration, which was defrauded for millions by Clinton and his cronies. As governor of Arkansas, Clinton created a tightly spun web of corruption. It is so complex, your mind will boggle at the connections. And over the next two nights, I will explain to you how it worked. Clinton regularly flew in the private plane of an influence peddler under investigation for drug dealing. He was later convicted for distributing cocaine. 
He gave the same man approval to sell hundreds of millions of dollars of Arkansas state bonds even after he was under investigation for dealing drugs and later when he was in prison dealt with corrupt judges, paid off regulators, used political influence to keep an insolvent savings and loan open, forced at least one state agency to lease offices owned by a Clinton friend at a higher than market rate and funneled state and crony legal business through Hillary protecting his crimes with attorney-client privilege. The power and money he was able to acquire just from looting a poor state like Arkansas will send you reeling. Now he and his cronies, which even the press calls the Arkansas Mafia, have taken over the government of the United States of America. Clinton has become the most powerful public figure on earth. This man this criminal must be stopped. That's why we're doing this series of programs. That's why Nick Guarino wrote his report. That's why many other people are digging into Whitewater, into Mena, Arkansas, into the depths of over 28 people closely associated with William Clinton, into the death of Vincent Foster, into the collapse of the savings and loan. Most newspapers and television news teams have not even touched this story. They merely skirt around it. When it was revealed that the Whitewater case was going before a grand jury, most newspapers buried the story if they covered it at all. Their liberal bias stops them from even beginning to look for the truth. Socialists have never been able to handle the truth, nor have they ever been mixed up in the truth. Nick Guarino spent the better part of 20 years in Arkansas. He ran a multi-million dollar business there, and he knows how business is done there. He played in the securities and brokerage businesses. He had millions of dollars invested in Arkansas banks and savings and loans. He invested heavily in Arkansas real estate. And he knew Bill Clinton, and he knew that Bill Clinton was corrupt. He also knew that Bill and Hillary would say when they discovered what he has released to the public, that he is an ex-convict fresh out of Leavenworth, and that's true. He was convicted of a white-collar crime, one count of mail fraud and one count of wire fraud. He claims that he was innocent, and he claims that he was railroaded, but folks, that is irrelevant. The more important point is that Nick Guarino knows what happened in Arkansas. He was incarcerated in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, with others who were involved and who knew what happened in Arkansas. He has thousands of documents from various sources, including news media such as the Washington Times, New York Times, Washington Post, and other leading publications. Bill and Hillary will no doubt smear Nick Guarino and try to discredit him, but they will never sue him. You see, in a court of law, he can depose them and subpoena documents that they want no one to see. He knows where the skeletons are. He was locked up with people who had inside knowledge of Clinton's corruption. Some of them were top players in savings and loan real estate scams of the 1980s and in illegal battle. If necessary, Nick Guarino can open up the Clintons like a can of worms. I would love for him to do that, and I'm sure, I'm sure that it will probably come to that. You see, this was the greatest country in the world. Cooks like Clinton are selling us down the river. It makes us all sick, and Clinton has got to be stopped. Clinton and his cronies have made their denials. They've hidden their documents. They've silenced their witnesses, but it's not enough. Tonight... Tomorrow night and Friday night, I intend to bust the cover up wide open and expose the crimes Clinton has committed. The one thing they can't fight is the truth. Truth is the mightiest power in the universe, and it will destroy Bill Clinton. It is the wishes of Nick Guarino. It is the wishes 
of the American people who care deeply about this country. Whitewater is part of a scheme to hustle millions from banks and savings and loans. And from CAGI investigations, it goes directly to the Central Intelligence Agency, the Office of Naval Intelligence, and G2 Army Intelligence. The first thing that Nick Guarino wants you to understand about Whitewater is that the land was not the main scam. The real crime is the looting of banks, savings and loans, the Small Business Administration, and the Arkansas Development Finance Authority for millions of dollars by Bill Clinton and his cronies. Whitewater was just one of the vehicles they used to make this happen. For the most part, the scheme was a series of land and loan deals. It involved many of the political and business elite of Arkansas. Bill Clinton, who as governor was the most powerful person in the state, he held the power to grant or refuse business rights, appoint judges and other key public servants, and to hand out lucrative state contracts, such as the bond deals for Dan Lassiter and the legal work to Hillary's law firm. He also controlled the purse strings of business in Arkansas through the Arkansas Development Finance Authority. Clinton received huge backdoor campaign contributions in return for political protection and other favors. James McDougall, former Clinton economic aide and the Clinton's partner in Whitewater. McDougall also was the co-owner of several other shady real estate ventures, and we'll tell you about that later. He was also the owner of the Kingston Bank and Madison Guarantee Savings and Loan. Clinton, McDougall, and other cronies looted Madison for millions. Steve Smith, another former aide and longtime Clinton friend. In 1978, Clinton, McDougall, and Smith decided real estate was Clinton's best bet for raising money because the governor would be less likely to have a conflict. Smith became president of the first bank Clinton tried to loot and was involved in several real estate schemes with Clinton cronies. He was recently subpoenaed in connection with Whitewater and Madison Guarantee. Jim Guy Tucker, Clinton's lieutenant governor and the current governor of Arkansas. Clinton hand-picked Tucker to succeed him. Tucker not only received a $1 million fraudulent loan from the SDA, but was also intimately involved in several of the real estate schemes. He was a partner in the Kingston Bank, which the FDIC slapped for giving out too many big loans to Clinton and his friends. Tucker is currently under investigation by the FBI and RTC. His records were recently subpoenaed. David Hale, a former Little Rock municipal judge appointed by Clinton. He made millions of dollars of fraudulent loans to Clinton's cronies through the Small Business Administration. At least one of the loans directly benefited Clinton. Hale says that Clinton pressured him to make the loans. Clinton says he can't recall this conversation. Hale is now under criminal indictment for defrauding the Small Business Administration. Seth Ward, the father-in-law of Hillary's law partner, Webster Hubble. Ward participated in some of the real estate ventures that went bust, approved a number of bad loans at Madison Guarantee as a director of the savings and loan, and defaulted on a $600,000 loan to the savings and loan himself. The federal government cited Ward's default as one of the worst abuses at Madison, but Hillary Clinton and her law firm, while representing the government, got the loan forgiven. Got the loan forgiven. David Lassiter, a millionaire businessman, gambler, and bond dealer. Lassiter's firm was a major source of brokered deposits to Madison, which was the major source of its explosive deposit growth. He donated huge amounts of money to Clinton's campaigns, paid off a drug debt for Clinton's brother Roger, took Bill on frequent trips in his private jet, and paid handsome legal bills to Hillary's firm. Clinton awarded Lassiter the lucrative license to sell Arkansas state bonds, even though he had been informed of Lassiter's corruption. Clinton continued to pass lucrative bond deals to Lassiter after the bond dealer was under investigation for distributing cocaine to friends and business associates. Later, in two separate cases, the regulators sought $3.3 million and then $4.6 million in damages from Lassiter. In both cases, ladies and gentlemen, Hillary got him off the hook for only $200,000 in the first suit and $250,000 in the second. The only problem? 
Hillary's firm didn't represent Lassiter. They represented the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Did you hear that? Hillary's firm didn't represent Lassiter. They represented the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. And finally, Hillary Clinton herself. After Bill became governor, her earnings as an attorney skyrocketed from $30,000 a year to $400,000. She repeatedly represented both state and federal regulators against her own friends and clients. These were severe conflicts of interest that should have immediately disqualified Hillary, but she never disclosed them. Don't go away. I'll be right back. During the Clinton years, it was casino time in the Arkansas financial institutions. Anything went. The worst abuses took place at the savings and loans because they were more unregulated than banks, and not just in Arkansas. It was part of a well-planned destruction of the economy of the United States of America. First, hitting the unregulated savings and loans, and next is the unregulated banks. This drew unscrupulous business people looking for quick money. It also made savings and loans the favorite rating place for politicians. The politicians granted the state charters. They appointed the few regulators who did oversee the SNLs. And it's no accident so many politicians have turned to savings and loans for financing. The mess they created may end up costing us over $1 trillion. Whitewater was the first venture of this type by Bill Clinton. It is an early blueprint of a series of real estate ventures developed by Clinton cronies. They all involved huge loans from savings and loans and banks owned by Clinton's pals. On paper, all of them supposedly lost money. You'll soon see that the only people who lost money were the taxpayers. If you're a taxpayer, Clinton and the insiders took out fortunes. The way deals like this work, folks, is simple. First, you locate a piece of property. Let's say it's 100 acres worth $75,000. You then get one of your real estate friends to value it at $150,000. You borrow 80% of that from the savings and loan, where another of your friends is a director. Already, you've raised $120,000, which is 80% of $150,000, from a property worth only $75,000. You might make some minimal improvements, like dividing the property into lots and bulldozing a few roads through it. If you're smart, you get the state to pay for it. Now, you can say that $150,000 piece of property is worth $2.5 million, and that lets you borrow even more money. If you want still more cash, you just arrange a few sham sales at inflated prices to other friends. Since the value of your property has increased so dramatically, your friend at the savings and loan can then approve an even larger loan. One property that we looked into, for example, was run up from 75000 to almost $4 million in about a year. It's a giant, gigantic, incredible Ponzi scheme. Whitewater had many of these elements. First, it was in the middle of nowhere. Nick Guarino 
has stated that he wishes that he could show you this piece of property. It was almost totally uninhabited. Even 15 years after the Clintons bought the property, all there is to show for their development is a couple of mobile homes, a handful of fishing shacks, and a house or two. Indeed, the biggest amount of money spent improving the Whitewater property was a $150,000 road that stretched two miles through the forest. And guess what, dear sheeple? It was paid for by the state of Arkansas. The property was also mortgaged for far higher than its value. The Clintons and their partners purchased it with 100% borrowed money, nothing down. At times, lots were sold and resold without recording deeds, irregardless of the fact that they had been sold before. There are conflicting reports about profits and losses, and the money, dear listeners, has disappeared. Two other ventures Clinton cronies were involved in, Campo Bello and Castle Grande, worked even better than Whitewater, and you don't hear anything about these. They were purchased for a few hundred thousand, but the loans against them ran into the millions, and remember, I've already told you, the crux of the matter is not the real estate. You ain't heard nothing yet. These, Campobello and Castle Grande, were purchased for a few hundred thousand, but the loans against them ran into the tens of millions. And Bill and Hillary Clinton have stated, quote, We don't know anything about Whitewater, unquote. And P.T. Barnum said, and I quote, There's a sucker born every minute, unquote. Bill and Hillary claim they were passive investors in Whitewater. They would have you believe they were innocent dupes in a series of unfortunate schemes perpetrated on them by unscrupulous cads. Nick Guarino and the Hour of the Time intend to demonstrate to you that the exact opposite is true. Number one, it was Bill Clinton himself who masterminded the schemes in connection with the intelligence community with its roots in the Central Intelligence Agency. Number two, Hillary, through her legal connections, was a key player in much of the fraud. And three, the Clintons and their friends benefited to the tune of millions of dollars. One thing you have to understand is that the political machine in Arkansas is one of the most corrupt systems in the nation. It's almost impossible to be in Arkansas politics and not be corrupt. And it is heavily under the control of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry of the Southern Jurisdiction. Well, let me give you two examples of what we're talking about here. One Arkansas governor insured every concrete and steel bridge in the state for fire. Fire, mind you. Every concrete and steel bridge in the state for fire. Now, who, dear listeners, do you think owned the insurance company? Another governor, up on fraud charges, fired the judge. He replaced him with the town drunk who promptly dismissed the grand jury that was about to hand down an indictment. Hallelujah, Arkansas. That's just politics as usual in Arkansas. Bill was just following in the footsteps of his illustrious predecessors. But you see, he had an extra incentive. The job of governor of Arkansas pays a dispiriting $35,000 a year. Clinton was not independently wealthy. He was a small-town boy with huge political ambitions. He was picked by the power structure. His mentor, his mentor was the man who wrote Tragedy and Hope. He was sent to England, to Oxford, under a Rhodes Scholarship to learn how to lead the sheeple into the new world order, into one world government. He's an Anglophile. He believes in British Israelism. He wanted to hobnob with the rich and the famous. And even with Hillary's law salary, he didn't have enough money. He needed cash, lots of it, and by the late 70s, he had already hatched a brilliant plan to raise money by taking it from someone else. And he was helped by the elite to dirty his hands. For in order to have their help to rise into power amongst those who call themselves illumined, 
You must be dirty, and they must hold the dirt. Madison Guarantee was pillaged to finance Whitewater and Clinton's mafia and to further the aims of the destruction of the United States of America, along with all the other savings and loans in this country. On paper, the Clintons and their partners, the McDougals, said they would convert this raw forest land into a vacation retirement community with dozens of lots. They said it would be a thriving new community. They bought white water with nothing down and then borrowed huge sums of money against it and funneled huge sums through it. First, they borrowed the 20000 down payment from Union Bank, which was later repaid with a new loan from Union Bank, taken out by Clinton Crony and present Arkansas Governor Jim Guy Tucker and McDougal. Then they borrowed another $183,000 from the Citizens Bank of Flippin. According to real estate agents and sales of neighboring property, the value of the land was supposed to be one-third of that, but by inflating the purchase price, you can borrow more against it. Later, Hillary got another $30,000 from Bank of Kingston using part of the same property that was already the collateral for the flippin' loan. Another $20,000 came from Security Bank of Paragould, which Bill used to pay off part of Hillary's loan. An additional $110,000 came from the diversion of an illegal SBA loan to McDougal's wife, so they had already borrowed $363,000 on property worth somewhere between $80,000 and $100,000. Later, indeterminate amounts appear to have been funneled into or through Whitewater from Madison and its shell companies. Around the time Whitewater development was formed, McDougal, along with other Clinton cronies, including Jim Guy Tucker, Arkansas's present governor, bought the Bank of Kingston. Steve Smith was appointed president. Within days of the purchase, McDougal, Tucker, and Smith began using the bank to finance Whitewater and Bill Clinton's political mafia. The bank loaned far more than the legal maximum credit limit to any one borrower. All the loans were going to prominent out-of-towners, political big shots who did not live in or around Kingston. Huge loans were going to Clinton cronies, including executives at major corporations like Walmart and Tyson Foods. Both Walmart and Tyson were large Clinton campaign contributors and recipients of juicy political favors. Hillary was on their board of directors. The solvency of the bank was threatened. It got so bad, ladies and gentlemen, that the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation began an investigation. In 1983, both Marlon Jackson, Arkansas State Banking Commissioner, and the FDIC demanded that Kingston stop making these loans. The FDIC said the loans threatened the stability of the bank. Clinton and his cronies were notified in writing and ordered to repay their loans. They then switched their scheme to savings and loans where the regulators couldn't get them. Soon after, McDougal bought Madison Guarantee Savings and Loan. Jackson, the regulator who stopped the loans to Clinton from Kingston, says he felt McDougal did this to escape the heavy regulation over the banks. The savings and loans were far less regulated. Quote, I've often thought that the reason he began using Madison Guarantee was because he had found that he couldn't do what he wanted with his bank, unquote, said Jackson. Madison was a tiny savings and loan in a tiny town. Its prospects looked dim, except Governor Clinton then intervened. He gave Madison approval to open a branch in Little Rock. This was highly prized among savings and loans. It meant Madison had instant access to a market that was literally a thousand times bigger. Later, Clinton sheltered Madison from regulatory scrutiny. Madison quickly became a large savings and loan, attracting $120 million in deposits. It did so by offering some of the highest interest rates to savers in the United States. You may recall the mid-1980s when Arkansas savings and loans sat on top of the list of highest interest-paying savings institutions. Madison was a leader in the race to attract the most deposits by offering high interest rates. It also began a series of fraudulent loan practices and deals with the political elite of Arkansas. Madison's furious expansion attracted federal regulators who stated in 1984 that Madison was in jeopardy from unsafe and unsound lending practices. 
According to the regulatory complaints, Madison made $17 million in loans to insiders, officers and their family, and politically prominent Arkansas citizens, including Bill Clinton. Jim Guy Tucker received over $1 million. Steve Smith received at least $65,000. Seth Ward received at least $600,000. In most cases, these businesses eventually failed. But Bill Clinton and his cronies kept on getting more loans for bigger and better amounts. And again, as I said, the money disappeared. Where did it go? I would suggest, ladies and gentlemen, you look into Mena, Arkansas and ask Ollie North. At times, tens of thousands of dollars were run through the Whitewater account at Madison in transactions that were apparently completely unrelated to Whitewater sales or expenses. Furthermore, huge overdrafts were mysteriously covered with deposits from various Madison subsidiaries and other McDougal corporations. Drug money. They used shell corporations to bury the transactions. The way they were able to do this was by using shell corporations, companies whose only purpose was to funnel funds out of the bank and into their pockets. These shell corporations were part of the focus of the RTC's first criminal referral, which named Clinton in 1992. The document outlines dozens of questionable loan transactions involving several Arkansas banks and 12 corporations affiliated with or doing business with Madison. Principals of the corporations include the Clintons, the McDougals, current Arkansas Governor Jim Guy Tucker, and other cronies. This document was suppressed by Clinton's machine during the presidential campaign. During the first half of 1985, Whitewater issued 10 checks for more than $70,000. Several were written to the bank of Cherry Valley, where Clinton had a campaign account. Unable to obtain the bank records, the RTC could not determine if the checks were deposited in the account. Five of the checks issued by Whitewater, totaling more than $60,000, were overdrafts that eventually were covered by funds from other alleged shell corporations or from Madison Financial Corporation, the SNL's wholly owned real estate subsidiary. One $30,000 check was issued on Whitewater's account to McDougal with a notation, quote, loan reaped payment, unquote. Though the RTC found no records of any loan from McDougal. More money laundering. That check resulted in an overdraft that was covered by a deposit of $30,000 from Madison Financial Corporation. In April 1985, according to SNL documents, Madison Financial Corporation deposited $30,000 directly into Whitewater's account as a prepayment on a 1985 bonus to McDougal, Madison Financial Corporation's president. Some of the money that went through the alleged shell corporations to Whitewater came from bank loans. Those corporations were created legally, but appear to have no business purpose whatsoever. Clearly, they were established purely to funnel money out of the bank. More money laundering. At times, the purpose is blatant. Among the shell companies cited in the first referral were ventures named Tucker Smith McDougal. Smith Tucker McDougal, and a third named Smith McDougal. Could anything, dear listeners, be a more obvious sham than that? Smith, McDougal, and Tucker were three of Clinton's aides and underlings. They, with Clinton as the obvious silent partner, hatched various sham real estate deals to raise money for Clinton. For example, the Castle Grandy trailer park to be near Little Rock was a grand scheme that ran up at least $2 million in loans, plus another million for a sewer plant to service the development. Nothing, nothing, nothing was ever developed. It's now an empty tract of land. There were no improvements. The land is littered with mattresses and old refrigerators. The land, according to some sources, is worth about $70,000. Where, where, where did the other $3 million go to? I suggest you look into Mena, Arkansas and ask Ollie North. Besides loans to Whitewater, the savings and loan funneled money to its owner's wife. One of the ways this was done was through a subsidiary, Madison Marketing. Madison Marketing handled $1.53 million of the thrift's business over a three-year period. The firm was owned by Susan McDougal, wife of the savings and loans owner. Her company apparently did no actual marketing for the bank. She merely collected commissions and borrowed money.
According to the RTC, the evidence indicates that Madison Marketing was a sham company that performed no actual marketing services. They simply paid the bills of other firms and added their own 15% markup. In turn, Madison Marketing funneled money to Whitewater and to Clinton, and this is illegal. Madison funds were used to pay Clinton's past campaign debts. Madison employees were urged to donate money to Clinton. The SNL's officers told them the savings and loan would pay them back. Of course, it is illegal for savings and loan funds to be used in this manner. We will probably never know how much Clinton made from this. It had the potential to quickly reach tens of thousands of dollars and maybe millions. One thing that's known for sure, ladies and gentlemen, is that in 1985, at Clinton's request, Jim McDougal hosted a cocktail party at Madison headquarters to help Clinton pay off a $50,000 campaign debt. About $30,000 was raised. At least one of the listed donors denies ever writing a check. The donor was a 24-year-old college student. He supposedly gave $3,000. It later turned out that his father had signed the check, not he, and that it came from his father. Who was the father, ladies and gentlemen? A politician named Charles Peacock. Peacock at first told reporters he knew nothing about the check. Later, he admitted he had signed it in his son's name and told them simply, quote, I'm a politician, and as a politician I have the prerogative to lie whenever I want, unquote. Most of the records of these donations have disappeared. What few documents remain have convinced federal investigators that at least some of the money may have come directly from Madison. Many of the donations were in the form of Madison cashier checks, usually written in the name of an individual in his account. Three months before McDougal helped Clinton cover his debt, Clinton had appointed a new state regulator in charge of savings and loans. The appointee, handpicked by McDougal, turns out to have been a Little Rock lawyer who had previously represented McDougal's savings and loan. Bank investigators are also trying to find out what happened to an undisclosed amount of money that went directly from Madison to Whitewater. The Resolution Trust Corporation, a federal agency, has sent a whole package of criminal referrals to the Justice Department recommending further investigation into these donations. Good luck, as they are in the hands of the instigator of the Waco Massacre, Janet Reno. So far, no one has been able to piece together just how much Bill Clinton and his friends benefited from the diversion of funds from Madison and Whitewater. The transactions are muddled, and what documents haven't been destroyed are being withheld from the public, many of them by Janet Reno, the brains behind the murder of the congregation of Branch Davidian in Waco, Texas. But we know Madison failed in 1989 with a shortfall of 47 to $68 million. It was owned by Jim McDougal, Clinton's former aide, business partner, and fundraiser. Clinton knowingly kept the SNL open, using his political influence, and continued to give favors to McDougal. As McDougal put it, quote, Bill never turned me down on something I asked for, unquote. Furthermore, as you'll see in a moment, Hillary handled Madison's legal entanglements with the regulators. It was due to her and Bill's influence that Madison was not shut down when its insolvency was first discovered. The ties, ladies and gentlemen, are simply too close for coincidence. Much of the paper trail has been buried forever in what has been called atrocious record-keeping. But the evidence shows that Bill and Hillary... Billery and their cronies were able to swindle millions, millions from this one savings and loan. Don't miss tomorrow night. Good night, and God bless you all. And God save the Republic.
in your hands, my dissatisfied fellow countrymen, and not in mine, is the momentous issue of civil war. You can have no conflict without being yourselves the aggressor. You have no oath registered in heaven to destroy the government, while I shall have the most solemn one to preserve, protect, and defend it. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strength, it must not break our bonds of affection.